this is the, uh, it's actually the second, but it feels like the first. So, um, so you guys can, can think of yourselves in either order. So this is part of a, a, a series of conversations that we, that USGBC is convening along with some support from, from Google to have a technical and a policy and a, and a scientific conversation about the, the, the role of materials transparency, the role of material hazards, and in how we think about building supply chains, building operations. And so what we wanted to do was have a, a fairly intimate gathering and, 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 and hopefully an opportunity for people on the phone to listen in to some folks who have been thought, who have been and are thought leaders in, in getting us to this point in time where we are asking essentially profoundly new questions about the role of materials in buildings about the, the, the potential hazards and relationship between building materials and health. And over the course of the year, you're going to see us do a number of events, not the least of which coming up with our friends at Catholic University on March 24th, um, which is uh, really focusing on the role of materials, the changing expectations for architects and design professionals, and going through the full year with a set of with a, with a set of speakers who we hope motivate this issue. And so today, I'm really excited to talk to in, to introduce you guys to. I'll get out of the way in just a second to two folks who have been who have really gotten us here with regard to the role of material selection in green building. And we're going to hear from them in sequence. And then I'm going to moderate some Q and A, take your questions, and kind of and have a discussion around these issues. And so the the two folks we have with us today, Brendan Owens is is the vice president for technical development for the lead rating system. And so the guts of LEED are what Brendan has chaperoned over the last uh, uh, nearly a decade of, of work. And so, and so he has also thought deeply about the role of, of the, the power of LEED as a tool for market transformation and the, the ability for LEED to pull the industry, to work with the industry, to change the, the, the way the industry works, whether that's building commissioning, energy modeling, low VOC paints. There's a tradition of LEED being able to get the market to do stuff. And that's a lot of it coming out of Brendan's vision for how this tool works and engaging with hundreds of volunteers and, and keeping them engaged to create a collaborative consensus system. And so Tom, Tom Lent is, is a policy director for Healthy Building Network, and he is absolutely a national and international thought leader on what does it mean, what, what are the health dimensions of products and materials. And so he has, he continues to kind of lead out in front with the kinds of things that we should be thinking about as an industry. And he's, he's brought these issues onto the table, and now he's dealing with the bread and butter issues of how do we, how do we basically select and understand the health aspects of materials. So, Hi, and excuse my, uh, my late night radio voice. I'm uh, just, uh, com at a, overcoming a uh, flu bug, which to the best of my knowledge was not uh, uh, originated in any uh, building materials. Um, my, but what I'm, I'm uh, tasked being the, the first or second or whatever the, uh, the, the, the kind of kickoff um, here with getting you a, a sense of how we got here to this, this seismic uh, shift that we see going on now in in awareness and concern about uh, about toxic chemicals in in building materials and what impact they may be having um, on our health and what to what to do about it. At one level, this isn't actually new at all. Um, you know, we've been worried about certain particular uh, chemicals of concern in building materials like uh, lead in paint for a long time. We worried about it for a way too long a time before doing anything about it. Um, likewise, asbestos is something we had indicators for quite a while before we finally acted on it. And in fact, my own organization, the Healthy Building Network, which started um, in 2000, started with a, a, uh, a campaign um, targeted on a particular chemical, in this case arsenic being used in pressure treated wood. Um, raised awareness of the uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich connection um, between kids climbing on climbing structures and uh, and their exposure to arsenic, and um, and convinced the manufacturers to withdraw that uh, that pressure treated uh, lumber treatment out of the uh, market with spectacular results on on the use of of that. But this this uh, chemical at a time approach has has great limits. We've been thinking about classes of chemicals that are problematic for a long time actually also, but focused on volatile organic compounds. First led by our nose, we realized that things were coming out of the materials we were building with and, and slowly started to understand that many of the things in which we sheathe ourselves uh, in interiors are emitting volatile organic compounds 
um, that, with, that can have uh, health impacts ranging anywhere from asthma to cancer. And since um, putting inhalers and, and gas masks on every desk wasn't really an effective uh, strategy for this, we instead worked on getting those out of, out of our interiors. Um, first, looking at the liquid, uh, the wet applied products like paints and adhesives and that, and trying to drive those VOC levels down as close to zero as possible with very, very striking results in the industry. And then we turned our attention from the wet applied products to the non-wet applied, to the furniture, the rugs, the, the, uh, the ceiling tiles, all, and realized that we could measure the emissions of, of these volatile compounds out of, out of products in the laboratory do a modeling that would then give us an idea of what kind of concentrations we could expect in a building, compare those to levels um, that, that had been determined by various authoritative agencies that were, um, that were safe, and, and build, um, build credits for the lead system on it. Um, that led to a whole ecosystem of labels cropping up um, for different product categories um, to run, run products through these tests. And certify that they that they met those those um, those thresholds. And the result of this is that uh, I just realized that little recorder is covering up some of my material. Oh well, um, that that for you know for the last decade or so, healthy building materials have been equated um, with indoor air quality testing, particularly with with either VOC content or VOC emissions, and that has um, resulted in tremendous product improvements. Um, we've really seen the results of having this, um, having these these labels and uh, the market drive that lead provided in place. There's still room for improvement. We've still got a lot to learn about the synergies of different uh, volatile compounds with each other, um, and to expand our our knowledge um, to a broader set of VOCs. But suffice to say, we're, we're we've made great progress and and. Um, and we've really improved our health there. But then a funny thing happened in the last decade while we were doing that, while at the same time that we were uh, reducing those volatile emissions and uh, reducing smoking, reducing the emissions from, from smokestacks and cleaning up the cars. We've done a lot of things to improve our air quality. And yet, certain health indicators have been going in the wrong direction. Um, particularly poignant being that some of these are children's, children's health issues, autism, asthma, um, preterm births, um, low birth weight, and even more poignant, pediatric brain cancer, kids coming like that. These have all been on the rise during this period where really important legislation that we passed in the 70s has been driving down the outdoor air quality problems and work that we've been doing on the indoor environment has been driving down volatiles. Particularly poignant to me is this one about cancer. This is not only a kid problem, but a, um, but a young and middle-aged woman problem, including my sister who, who contracted cancer in her, in her early 40s. How many people know someone who has died of cancer too young? Yeah, we all, we all have that connection. Well, what's going on here? We don't know yet, but there's some, there's some indicators that there's a whole other aspect of our built environment that we've not been paying attention to. And that is, um, that is related to a larger chemical issue, which is that there are industrial chemicals that through biomonitoring work that's been going on in the last, last few years, looking at blood samples from people and including human umbilical cord blood, we're discovering that industrial chemicals that we didn't think were getting into people are getting into people and including, including into kids even before they're born. And many of these include en endocrine disrupting chemicals, by which I mean chemicals that imitate hormones, block hormones, that somehow mess with the hormone signaling system, which is key to development of, of, the, of the young body in the, in the womb and, and during that first decade. Um, we're finding a, astonishing a number of these chemicals in, um, in cord blood as well as in, in adult samples, um, widespread, um, throughout the United States, it's not concentrated in, in, in one place or another. It's something that we're all, all exposed to. And there are many, you know, and, and, you know, in addition to just the concern about this, these, we're seeing these, these levels rising. And so this, this, is, this is a chart that most of you are probably quite familiar with, the chart of increasing carbon dioxide emissions in the, in the upper atmosphere that we're so concerned about 
indicating um, indicating problems with how we're dealing with <laughs> with our carbon emissions and climate change. We're seeing an odd parallel with the kinds of, of increase in concentrations that we're seeing in the microcosm in our bodies with some of these chemicals. This is the halogenate flame retardant um, retardants. Because these things are um, not, only, not, not that our use of them is increasing as rapidly as that curve might indicate, but these things are bioaccumulative, meaning that they, they store up in the body. They're, they're easier to take in than they are to, to, uh, to get out. Um, this increasing evidence of exposure to these other chemicals led the EPA back um, um, early in the, in the Obama administration to, uh, to start looking at a, a set of chemicals of, of concern um, through a combination of looking at the biomonitoring results and, and potential for widespread exposure. Um, many of these are chemicals that we use in our, our building materials um, throughout. And the problem is that any of these are not volatiles. So that means that these programs that we've set up, while they're doing a great job of, of addressing the volatile chemicals, they're not addressing this new class of semi-volatiles and, uh, and, and non-volatiles that we're using in the building materials. We've kind of assumed we're locked away in there, but it turns out they're showing up in, in the dust. They're ending up, uh, ending up in people. Um, we did a study of um, of asthmogens recently looked at the uh, um, at the the range of asthmogens that have been identified through occupational health studies to be um, significant uh, causes of oh, interesting yeah I think I'll cancel that <laughs> and <clears throat> when we found when we looked at looked at the major asthmogens that occupational um, health analysts are concerned about these days and cross that with the ones that we found in our study of building materials with what's in building materials where we thought that there was likely occupant exposure. Um, we found 20 asthmogens that are on the on the levels of high concern, many of these being ones that affect early childhood development. These are not asthma triggers in the classic sense. These are as these are causative agents that cause the, the phenomenon of asthma sensitivity in the, in the body in the first place. So we're talking about the things that, that early in, in childhood give a, a person a predilection to be triggered with asthma later on. And again, these, are, these were almost entirely semi-volatiles or for other reasons not covered by the current VOC emissions programs. And there are a lot of good reasons for that, it's not just that we that we focused on volatiles because because we thought volatiles were were interesting and the rest were not. But there are a lot of challenges in do in taking the kind of approach. We can't just patch the semi volatiles into um, into the the VOC programs. Measuring this stuff is is much more complicated than measuring things that off gas. Um, there is much less information about about levels of levels of safety. Uh, there's, they're just, and for many of these things, there are not known thresholds uh, below which, uh, thresholds of concentration in the indoor environment below which you do not need to worry about them. And of course, this also does not, um, does not capture, the VOC programs which don't capture our concern about what happens in the manufacture, what happens with the fence line communities and with the, the, the chemicals that are emitted from the manufacture of these processes. So, thankfully, of course, we have regulation. Remember back in, uh, in the Nixon era when, um, regardless of what you thought of Nixon, he signed an awful lot of good environmental regulation that really, um, that really did an amazing job of cleaning up a lot of aspects of our environment and reducing our exposure to toxics from the smokestack and the, um, and the, and the exhaust and, the, uh, and, the, and, um, and water emissions. And... Uh, and there was also a piece of legislation passed about chemicals in commerce um, as well as that time. Um, and at that point, there were about 83,000 chemicals in the EPA inventory. Unfortunately, this was not the lion of this set of, of regulations. It was more the pussycat of, of that. And um, most of the chemicals in commerce at that time were grandfathered in, assumed safe unless proven otherwise. Very few have been tested out of that, um, even fewer. 
like five, have had been had partially regulated out of this Toxic Substance Control Act, or TOSCA, as you may have heard it being referred to recently. And um, one of those, asbestos, of all things, asbestos, the asbestos ban was actually overturned um, in court. So it has, though, regulation has not exactly proven to be um, a strong ally in, uh, in our efforts to, um, to reduce exposure to toxic chemicals. And as a result, a number of um, architectural firms, owner firms, um, other systems <laughs> uh, have developed chemicals of concern lists to try to avoid and, and shift it from the, from the approach with VOCs of finding safe thresholds, lacking safe thresholds, just trying to avoid chemicals of concern uh, entirely. This has been an interesting phenomenon, and it's resulted in, in a whole set of chemicals of concern, of little red lists, lists uh, published by different organizations, which has um, provided a, uh, a really challenging um, target for manufacturers and for other design firms trying to, uh, trying to adjust their, their specifications to, uh, to uh, account for this as well. Um, the you know the plethora of of lists is um, makes a target that's impossible for anyone, and and it leaves us the red lists leave us with with a challenge. And I'll use the popcorn example to describe this. Dicetyl is uh, a chemical that is used in microwave popcorn to make it have that wonderful buttery flavor taste. He discovered that acetyl is the cause of a rare form of lung disease, which is not so rare amongst those who, who manufacture the popcorn. It was, uh, there, was, there were various bans on this in place by various states, various moves to red list it. It was replaced with 2,3-pentanidione, uh, which also has the same yummy, utterly flavor and turns out to have some of the same problems. Um, and so we, we've done what we call in the business a regrettable substitution. So what do we do about this? We're trying to move beyond red lists. Um, all right, so, so red lists have gotten a lot, of, uh, a lot of people's attention. They've gotten a lot of movement going on, on the move to identify chemicals of concern and start to move away from them. But they beg the question of, can we, can we identify what's actually good instead of just what's bad? Chemicals aren't inherently bad. It's just we have a lot of chemicals which cause problems in use right now. And their primary, primary tool that I use is something called the green screen. It's a benchmarking system to benchmark a pathway toward inherently safer chemistry. Talking about inherently safer, meaning lower hazard, meaning you don't have to worry about exposure. We'll probably get into that more in the, in the Q&A. This is based on work that's been done at the EPA under the Design for the Environment program and aligns with uh, globally harmonized standards for labeling um, and the categorization systems that it uses. So it's not inventing a new system, it's actually building on, on, on underlying systems that industry is using, but to provide a pathway um, to, you know, so it starts with um, a bunch of um, uh, priority health effects, carcin uh, cancer, gene mutation, um, reproductive and developmental toxicity, and, and endocrine disruption. Um, starts with I, with uh, with benchmarking at its lowest level. One, the uh, th those chemicals that are known to cause that those um, those effects, and and then works up um, <coughs> through first looking at the red list, but then filling in the many data gaps that that leaves with scientific literature and test data, um, and then recognizing that we have only tested a small portion of the chemicals use analogs and modeling systems to try and fill in the data gaps and provide us with a better sense of what chemicals are affirmatively, affirmatively better. Um, Cradle to Cradle uses a somewhat similar um, uh, system to this in its benchmarking of chemicals. We'll get into that a little later about how those two may start to play together. Of course, you can only do this kind of thing if you actually know what's in the product uh, to begin with. Um, and our current state of knowledge of what's in the products that we use is, is pretty bad. Um, whether you're the, the design firm or the final manufacturer, you're often faced with MSDSs, which look kind of like this, um, and with, with major uh, proprietary, uh, um, proprietary listings, which make it very difficult. Now, we, you know, in, 
in you know in our at our breakfast table we're kind of a, come to the assumption that we can get a pretty good idea of what's in that breakfast cereal and if we've got a daughter who's allergic to wheat we can um, we can avoid that um, the situation building materials is kind of now like if as if the nutrition label was stamped with a trade secret and all we had was the uh, you know was the low fat label um, we initially developed the Faro system as a, as a starting way to address this as providing a system for manufacturers to um, to disclose and understand the potential toxic impact of the materials that they were they were using. It's backed up by, a, uh, by an extensive chemical hazard database um, of about 34,000 uh, materials and about 60 authoritative hazard um, lists that provide their, the rankings um, for chemicals. And for a smaller subset of the chemicals, those were that we've actually researched within um, our building material library, we also study the process chemicals that go into the manufacture um, of those chemicals, both to understand what may be going on at manufacturing and understand what residuals may end up in the, uh, in the product from the manufacturing process. And then we provide uh, scoring systems that'll, that allow comparison. Um, oh, of course, this is just one of a number of things that have been going on in the, in the industry as different players in the industry have, have prodded trying to understand what's in products and what's coming out of them. And, and establish some kind of protocol for evaluating it. And it's it become um, kind of a chaos of transparency um, with a lot of different questionnaires and efforts manufacturers feeling a little beleaguered um, by all of this. Uh, the, the, the health product declaration was an effort to make some sense out of all of this and to create one open format standard for manufacturers to communicate product content emissions and health hazard um, and it was designed by and for the design professionals and building owners who are going to be ultimate consumers of this information. Um, with an extensive involvement from manufacturers, we initially, when we uh, decided to pilot, we developed the first draft of this and piloted it. We hoped we could get 12 manufacturers who'd be willing to, to step forward and participate in this big disclosure experiment. We ended up having to close the door at 30 um, when we had as many as we, more than we could handle. Um, the result of that is, is the health product declaration that was released a year and a half ago at Green Build um, and has been adopted as, um, as one of a set of tools, including Pharos and the Cradle to Cradle um, system that an increasing group of, of uh, architecture firms are requesting um, their manufacturers to use to, supp to supply information about products so they can begin to assess these things. It's a, it's uh, a, going to require continuous improvement. There's a health product declaration collaborative now that this process has been spun off into, which owns the standard and, and is establishing um, processes with, um, with users and manufacturers to, uh, to improve the, that. Now, all of this um, may, may still sound confusing to you with, with even, even if we narrowed it down to, uh, um, to these players and, uh, and maybe declare also. Um, uh, negotiating in the space for, um, for disclosure um, and transparency, um, but, and, and that can lead to a lot of uh, continued um, dismay and bafflement amongst manufacturers and architectures alike, but we are all working together. Um, thanks to uh, some support from the U.S. Green Building Council, we've been holding, um, been holding harmonization discussions uh, to to orchestrate how each of these systems can, can work from a common base and are making great progress on that. So all of you, how many of you actually work in the design of buildings or specification of, of, of products? Any of you? Of you? How many of you um, went to uh, study chemistry or otherwise you know, got into buildings because, um, because you wanted to know more about chemis chemistry and toxicology? I don't see any hands. Yeah, so you may be asking, why do we have to be the front line on, on dealing with this. And you know, the, the bottom line is that we have a system, which I sometimes call it a broken system, but it's actually not even just a broken, it's not a broken system. It's just a, a system that hasn't gotten the right inputs. Um, and you know, for a long time, the performance parameters for building materials have been about the physical performance, how long it lasts, how long it holds its look, you know, how well it holds a screw, those kinds of things. And the signal just hasn't been in the system that we care about <coughs> the toxic content of the materials. And so what you design is going to be reflected in 
what a manufacturer um, tries to assemble, which is going to be and reflected in how a product designer is going to is going to design their product, which is going to be reflected in how a material manufacturer designs their material, which will ultimately get to where we really need to get, which is where the chemical formulations are being designed in the first place. And you know, and if we if we had a different if we had a different political um, framework, we might be able to do this in a top-down way and just tell the guys at the at the uh, upper left-hand corner how to design chemicals, but we don't. Um, and so the most you know, the most potent force we have right now is is the force of the marketplace, as Lead has shown. And so you know what we what we what we design, what we ask for, is what will be designed by the system. That's how that's how the free market works, and that's why that's why we're asking the design community to to take these steps to understand what's what's going on in uh, in the products that they that they specify and add health to their performance characteristics that they that they look for. Um, we'll get I'm sure a lot deeper into what that means next, but I'm going to turn it out turn it over now to Brendan, having sort of set the context of how we stirred this pot and. Uh, to talk about how LEAD has, has engaged it. <coughs> a segue like we planned it, right? Yeah, thanks, Tom. That was great. Uh, so with that as a transition, I think Tom's, Tom's uh, 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 last slide was, was exactly right. I mean, people design what or the product manufacturers build what we want to buy. That's not just a buildings phenomenon. That's, that's, that's a lot of other things. And I, I think that Tom said it. One way, I, I'd say it's slightly different. I don't think the system, I agree, the system's not broken. The system just wasn't designed to do what we're now asking it to do. So there's new stuff that we want to uh, communicate to the people who make the things that we make buildings out of. And the, the, the positioning of Lead V4 at this time is something that we've been excited to be able to play a role in that. I think that the, as you look at the trends, is that working? All right, great. Um, but I want to step back from the diving into the, the specific materials piece and, and sort of reorient and take an opportunity to sort of say that lead is not about the, the attributes of the things that we're making buildings out of, right? We don't necessarily strive for high recycled content in our buildings. We don't strive for energy efficiency. What we want are the outcomes that those proxies, those strategies deliver. So when we're looking at recycled content, we're looking at reduced use of virgin materials. We're looking at reduced use of, of energy uh, in order to, to, to bring those materials to market. So with the, with the launch of LEED V4, we took a step back and said, all right, what is it we're actually searching for? What do we want buildings that are using the LEED rating system to be good at? And we came up with this list of seven system goals. And I'm not going to go through them, but I want you guys to keep this in mind as we go through this discussion, because these are the things that the actions that we are encouraging the buildings, pro buildings products industry and, and people in the buildings industry in general to, 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 to deliver, right? So if we're looking at a, health, at, at a health product declaration, it's not about transparency. It's about setting up a framework that allows us to make more informed decisions, better decisions about the health consequences of the things that we're putting into our buildings. So from a first principle standpoint, this is what we want out of LEED projects. And as we go through the process of developing LEED, one of the things that I think has made it extraordinarily successful in the market is that it has been a conversation between the people who have been running around, you know, screaming that we have problems, at, you know, looking at the large pattern science, whether it's climate change, drought, uh, the, 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 the macro level trends that, that Tom looked at, from, that Tom pointed out from a human health perspective, and, and really pushing for and, and, and bringing a sense of urgency to these discussions. People like me, I, I will definitely throw myself into that, uh, proudly into that, into that uh, community. Uh, but balanced by a group of very pragmatic and, and very focused individuals who are helping us make sure that we don't disconnect the idea of what we're trying to accomplish from the engine that drives it all, which is the market, right? So this balance between uh, the, 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 the urgency that we all feel to make changes that are that are desperately needed, but to make it in a way that is pragmatic and transformational rather than just you know pure and and lets us you know feel good about the fact that we have a, a, a an aspirational goal which nobody can hit uh, that's demotivational so from from the standpoint of the way that we've put this rating system together we've tried to balance these two things 
So I hope that as we go through this, and I hope that as V4 hits the market, you feel that tension. You feel the instances where USGBC and LEED haven't gone far enough, and you give us that feedback. And then on the opposite end of that equation, I hope you feel the moments where you think we might have gone too far and provide us with that feedback as well. So I'm going to dive into the material section a little bit uh, for, for, for V4. Um, for those of you familiar with previous versions of the rating system, this is the most consequential change that we've ever made to, that, that we have made for LEED V4. The materials and resources section is uh, the most consequential change that we've made for V4. And I think it's in the running for the most consequential, ma consequential change that we've made to LEED over the course of its 13-year, 14-year history. And I, I think that a lot of that is driven off of the fact that we have 20,000 case studies of projects that have come through the design, the, the commercial certification process and 50,000 on the residential side that have basically gone through and given us a, an understanding of where the market has changed. For those of you who are practitioners, how hard is it to get the recycled content credit? Very, very easy. But it wasn't 13 years ago. It was actually pretty tough. It was damn near impossible to get the low VOC credit. Right? because those products weren't out there. But over the course of the time that LEED has been in the market, that transformation has come about. And I think that when I look at what I'm excited about from, from a LEED V4 perspective, they kind of break down into two credit categories, or two sort of nesting categories in the, in the MR section. There are credits that deal with the things that, you know, what we do with our waste, and there are credits that deal with the things that we buy. I'm going to focus on the credits that deal with the things that we buy. Um, and I think that when I look at the the success of the credits in the past that, that has enabled it, that have enabled product designers and, and, and developers to get the credits that are in the rating system pre-V4 very easily. I'm actually very excited because we know the model that drove tho those transformations was successful and we've replicated it in what we're trying to do with V4. So hopefully we'll have the same amount of success. And to walk you through this, walk you through this circle, it really depends on, you can enter it basically this, this cycle in, in any, at any of these stages. But I'm going to enter it from the top uh, because the idea of what we're, you can put anything at the center of this from a, from a materials section, from a materials perspective, you can put recycled content, bio-based material, low VOC, um, and including the things that we're doing with V4, and, and have a, a ostensibly the same outcome. So. Reporting, which is an activity that, that, in, that, that transfers knowledge from one group, product manufacturers in this case, to another group, uh, building specifiers and designers, enables uh, the, the people who are consuming that information to, to conduct some sort of evaluation. Does it comply with the lead credit? Does it, uh, does it have the compressive strength that I need? Is it flexible enough? Is it durable enough? Those reporting activities create a, a mechanism for evaluation. The evaluation sets up a mechanism that allows the market, the consumer of that information, to indicate by the selection of their material a preference for some attribute of the material that's out there. It might be color, it might be shape, it might be taste, it might be chemical ingredient content. That preferential selection is a market signal back to the, the, the supply chain, the, the upstream uh, graphic that Tom showed, that there is a an opportunity for innovation and for market differentiation if a product manufacturer takes certain actions. If I change the durability of my material, of my material, if I change the ingredient that is some could, could be considered problematic, that signal from the market designers back to the product manufacturers is a signal for the potential for and the desire for innovation. That innovation rep necessitates more reporting. If I'm a product manufacturer and I change the formulation of my product, that gives, you, gives somebody an opportunity, it gives me a new opportunity to approach the market and say, hey, I fixed that thing or I enhanced that thing. I fixed that thing you didn't like or I enhanced that thing that you did like. And we're back at that, we're back at that sort of top of that virtuous cycle. And when I look at the materials credits that deal with the things that product, that, that, that lead buildings buy and are made out of, this is, the, this is the core of what's going on with these things. And we've returned to that thinking with the approach that we br have brought to materials and resources for LEED V4. Uh, we have centered the, the, the materials and resources section of LEED on a, a very robust engagement uh, for the first time on, on real 
analytic life cycle uh, multi-attribute thinking. Um, and we have augmented, so, so we have, a, we have a, a credits that deal with whole building optimization and life cycle assessment, which are incredibly valuable in terms of understanding not necessarily the, the, the aspects of, of whether or not uh, you know, cement mix A is better than cement mix B, but taking it one step further back, is cement the right choice to use in this particular application? And then optimization of the amount of material that you're using uh, in the application that you do end up using. So there's tremendous opportunities for, for those types of uh, life cycle assessments to inform the, the, you know, how much our buildings weigh going forward. Uh, in addition to that, and, and sort of acknowledging and leaning into the limitations associated with life cycle assessment as a single, as a multi-attribute, but limited assessment framework, we have encouraged the, in, the, the, the proliferation of information about material ingredient uh, reporting and uh, the things that are going into the products that we are making our buildings out of. We've done that in a couple of different ways across a couple of different parameters. The first way that we've done it is that we have encouraged uh, the use of environmental product declarations. EPD is a, is a framework for communicating uh, various environmental attributes of building products. And then we have a, a framework, a, a set of uh, criteria that reward product manufacturers uh, f and, and, and give incentive to product manufacturers and reward lead buildings that specify materials for for which uh, uh, some type of material ingredient reporting uh, has occurred. So a health product declaration in, in that case. And then the last piece is that we're looking at uh, where the materials that we're making buildings out of are being extracted from, so raw material sourcing issues. Because as we were looking at life cycle assessment and as we were looking at what it's capable of and what it's good at, uh, there is a, an understanding among the people who are practitioners and, and a, among the broader community that engages in these types of discussions that material issues re related to human health are not particularly well represented in the in the existing life cycle practice uh, and issues related to ecosystem impacts associated with raw materials extraction are not particularly well represented so as we go through the process of uh, expanding out all the different pieces of the, this puzzle I'm going to dial it in just on the on the uh, the, the V4 credit that deals with material ingredient uh, reporting and optimization. This credit is broken down in, into two, two main pieces. The first piece is about creating incentives for product manufacturers to disclose information about their products, to give the people who are specifying those products a better understanding of what is, what, what, what decisions and what things they should care about when they're looking at a material. So the health product declaration uh, is, is one framework. Uh, the, the information that, that comes out of the activity involved in cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification is another framework. REACH is a framework. There's a variety of different frameworks that, 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 are be, that have been set up that we're trying to leverage to make it possible for more information to be in the hands of the people who can then use that information to make better decisions, more informed decisions about the, the materials that they're using. Which leads into the second part of the credit, which is actually doing something with that information once you get it. Looking at the uh, looking at the ability to optimize around certain parameters relative to human health. So when you're looking at all of this in uh, you know from from a, from a goals perspective, you know the goals coming back to the, the the initial slide that I showed about the lead system goals. Transparency is a means to an end. What we actually care about is whether or not the decisions that we're making are actually promoting uh, human health through improved material selection. Um, so the optimization of all of that information and the and the and, and understanding where those trade-offs are a good idea and where trade-offs between different materials and, and material ingredients are a bad idea so we don't end up with the regrettable substitution examples that that Tom has uh, ha has highlighted for us um, so looking specifically at what this entails um, the first part from a reporting perspective is it is you know the goal of this credit is to, to increase the use of building products with uh, who have disclosed information that we that we that, that we can make decisions around, um, and the second part of the credit is to set up a mechanism that allows for optimization based on that information. 
I'm hesitant to share this uh, particular slide because I'm not much of a of a, of a pundit, uh, but I I want to talk about what the the continuum that we're on because you know I've said you know material ingredient reporting and transparency is is a means to an end. I want to sort of highlight what that end might look like uh, as we sort of have been thinking about evolution of the, the lead beyond where we are today, even though everybody is exhausted with uh, V4 already after six public comments. Uh, you know, the, the information that we're collecting, the information that we are uh, hoping to, to, to generate as a, and use as uh, transformative five years from now, hopefully, you know, no product comes out without, without an HPD. Um, and sort of planning for that day because we know that lead is a significant market force and understanding that if we don't have a plan for what to do with it, we're going to end up having to make another major course correction going forward for there. So I just want to rewind a little bit and talk about pre-lead V4. We were looking at materials in a single attribute on a single dimension. So we're looking at something like recycled content. And recycled content is not a bad thing. Um, but we were also looking at things like rapidly renewable. And the regrettable substitutions that are inherent when you're looking at bamboo sourced from China versus locally grown FSC certified hardwood are, are I don't I think that's I think those it's, uh, at this point my sense is a, a room that's interested in this discussion seems to understand that those differences are pretty self-evident. So as we moved into lead V4, we wanted to get away from single attribute single dimension. But we still have what amounts to compartmentalized multi-attribute across multi-dimensions, right? So we're looking at, at, at health in a building product, independent at this point of environmental issues in the EPD, at this point independent of the, the, the raw material origins uh, considerations that, that need to be considered. Um, and I think that that is, that from my perspective, is the state of the conversation that we can have today. We've built uh, a, a tremendous amount of capacity for understanding that multi-attribute uh, analysis across these multi-dimensions is something that we need to be engaged in. But I don't think our industry and our technology has advanced to the point where we can weave those three things together right now and make coherent sense of it. Um, so, but that's not really where I think the end goal is. What we're talking about eventually getting to and what we're planning for, all the information architecture that we're standing up to, to, to collect this information and the, and the tools, the analytic tools that we are, that we are generating and preparing and, and, and deploying into the market to make sense out of that information are, are gearing up to, at some point down the line, be woven together into that, into that comprehensive material assessment framework so that we're doing simultaneous multi-attribute, multi-dimension analysis uh, that does that makes it possible for us to make very very informed very very smart decisions about how we construct our construct our, our built environment so as as I'm looking at the the longer term trajectory for <laughs> where we're headed with this foundational work that we're doing right now I see a long road I see three to five years from now um, we're we're going to be you know I think we'll be we'll start seeing the type of market transformation that happened um, in the commoditization of, uh, you know, VOC content information and recycled content information that's occurred over the last ten years, uh, and that's going to be a great that's going to be a great mechanism. But there is still one step and maybe one more beyond that that we need to be engaged in uh, as we as we make sense of this, I make use of this information to make better decisions. But I I'm I'm really encouraged to see the market dynamic that exists today feeling very much like the market dynamic that existed 13 years ago when LEED first hit the market. And what I mean by that is when LEED was, was, was running out in its 2.0 and its 2.1 versions, the leadership product manufacturers stepped to the fore. So we had that vanguard of building product uh, manufacturers who wanted to lead who, you know, who bought into this mission, who, who, are, who have been sustaining it all along, they stepped to the fore when LEED was initially released. And over the course of the 13 years that, that have transpired since, the market's gotten very cluttered and, cl and, and clouded. And that's, that's, that's great. That's transformation. There is another opportunity today.
for those same organizations to step to the fore. And it's wonderful to see it happening again because it gives me the sense that they are going to pull the rest of the markets that have been riding their coattails for the last 10 years again. Um, and I think that that's very encouraging from my perspective. So I'll leave it there. I'm looking forward to any questions and the conversation that we can have. Uh, thanks for coming. And uh, please do not forget to go to the USGBC website and throw your hat in the ring if you're interested in being on a committee. We desperately need the help. Thanks. Tom is motivating a sort of a decade plus long effort to to bring some direction to a kind of a missing dimension of building of, of change in the building sector. <coughs> Brendan is articulating how the tools that we call green building, the tool we call lead, is part of that arc. And so what I what my suggestion at this moment is that I'm going to um, throw out some devil's advocate questions to them, and uh, and uh, and so. Devil's advocate questions, and, and and get a sense of their reaction, and then I'll, then we'll, we have enough time to have to have questions from you guys and have a bit of a dialogue. And so, um, all right. So Tom, I, maybe I'll let you start with this one. So many of the things that we that we might recognize as a hazard are things that, hey, I can eat a shovelful of titanium dioxide, and if I can get a hold of a shovelful, but it clinically in, in experimentation on rats, it doesn't do anything. Why do I care? Well, that's part of what the uh, um, part of what the, the green screen benchmarking is about is is trying to um, trying to qualify our hazards by by levels of hazard. You know, this is not just saying anything that that comes up with a lab result of connection with a health endpoint should be tossed out. Anyway, You're saying it's not a red list. And so, right, where, where what I'm trying to encourage the community to do now is to move from red list to a more nuanced benchmark system that looks um, at hazard in, in, a, in a leveled system that looks at different levels of hazard and, and looks for ways of, um, of finding, finding materials that have a firm, what I call affirmatively lower hazard, um, that, are, that are affirmatively safer um, by inherent characteristics, but, um, but not not excluding everything just because. And then the titanium dioxide actually is an interesting one because um, you know it's it's one of a small small but important set of chemicals that pop up on these red lists, um, but pop up in certain forms or just there's certain there's certain particular forms in, in terms of titanium dioxide. It's uh, very small particles that are in, inhalable. And so we've got some work to do to make our use of these authoritative hazard lists that are flagging. Um, the issues more nuanced to be able to filter out some of the hazards that may be specific to um, one kind of um, one kind of circumstance, such as a particular kind of manufacturing situation, from those that are more generally applicable to exposure throughout the environment. Gotcha. So, all right, Brendan. So, I, I hear all this nice nuance that Tom has. And so, <laughs> remind me, V4 is just a big red list, black list thing, right? Yeah, that's totally. <laughs> no, it, it's definitely not. I, I think that that's one of the things that's the challenge is, you know, there's a, I, I look at part of the job that USGBC does and the league, league committees do as taking the available tools and trying to apply them in the most logical way possible. And the, the reality is that I think that we all acknowledge that the tools aren't as good as they need to be. But that's not necessarily the same thing as saying that they're not good enough to start using and, and making transform, transformation with them. So I, I think that the, the, the understanding of, you know, in a broad context, public health and human health in the built environment is something that has been woefully underrepresented in research and uh, you know, gives us the ability to, 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 to broaden our horizons in a very, in a very inspiring on one side of the equation and probably very ultimately in the short term disheartening uh, as the information starts to accumulate um, way. But the, 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 there is enough information out there to act on certain things. And from my perspective, the pragmatic nature of the way that USGBC engages the market with lead is an appropriate balance between the information that we know and can act on and the information that we are still seeking more information on. 
one of the things that's great about the way that we build the rating system that is, is that it is uh, inherently capable of taking that information, new information, and you know, changing course. So periodic updates, the pilot credit working group that we've established and the, and the pilot process in general gives us the ability to, to take the newest and best science that's out there and inform what we currently have on the books in very uh, hopefully productive ways. All right, so that's good. All right, back to Tom for a second. Okay, so question, so related question. So I'm on. A, so a lot of the early adopters here are uh, take our friends at, at, at Google. They have the expertise, the inclination to really push down and push hazards out of there, uh, and, and really pay attention to this issue. As this issue goes into the mainstream, so much of green building is, is couched in terms of return on investment. And I, and you know, I'm being you know, I, you hear time and time again, I'm doing green because green goes to the bottom line. How, when you when you look at a project team and you say how much should I be willing to pay to reduce the, some metric of hazard by some amount? One dollar, ten dollars, a million dollars, ten million dollars? What is, what is that cost benefit curve? What is that notion that propels so much of our industry? Does it have any utility here? Does it, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you begin to have that conversation about the, the, how much should I be willing to pay to avoid these things? And how do I even begin to answer that question? That's the ten million dollar question, and uh, you know, and the and the life answer is, what's a life worth? But, <laughs> but that doesn't really We've help. We've got EPA here; they know exactly how much. <laughs> we're going. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be asking that in DC. Um, <laughs> well, I've got a number of different ways I tackle that. You know, the nerd in me says we're, you know, that we need a lot, lot better data in order to be able to do that. We're in in discussions with how to use the information that we're gathering as we, as we work on disclosure to better inform the kind of public health studies we do that will give us that kind of pros and cons. Um, then the other, then the practical side of me that, uh, that is recognizing that people are trying to make decisions now, not 10 years from now when my studies finally um, produce uh, actionable numbers, is that remember that, you know, that what we're what we're talking about, particularly when we get to the endocrine disruption chemicals, um, are, are chemicals where the old toxicology uh, saw of the dose makes the poison um, isn't really functional anymore, unfortunately. And these are ones where timing is much more important than, um, uh, than dose. Um, when, when the child in the womb gets exposed to a particular chemical and what developmental process they were in that day, um, and whether that, that particular process is vulnerable to that chemical is what, you know, what makes the difference. And so, so I like to encourage people who are, who are daunted by this, overwhelmed by what it would cost to do everything that, you know, that my tools might indicate would be worth doing, um, <clears throat> that you start where you can start. You start with the, you, you take the indicators you can from the tools we're developing to find where the hot spots are, and then you work at them as you, as you can with, with, what, your, with what, you know, what, what your process allows, with what that project allows, which may be varied by the, you know, the particular health interests of the, of the client. It may just be simple budgetary things. Knowing that everything that you do do has the opportunity to affect the life of some child in that in that building. And so I try to emphasize more of the positive of what you are, you know, what you're going to gain from what you can do, which is why I'm delighted that, you know, the lead system is, has, has started off on this path with attainable goals rather than trying to sweep the whole, the whole building of all toxics at once, trying to say, let's find a group, get them out and work and work our way on that way that every piece that you do can make, can make a difference. And that to me at this point of the game when we're still learning a lot about the whole scope, we're still getting, you know, gaining, improving our tools for how to get the most bang for the buck. The most important part is to start moving and start getting information into the system and start making differences where you can. Okay. Do you have anything to add? It's pretty good. I mean, yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think that's good enough. <laughs> All right, All right. La last one for me. I mean, um, so for some, uh, kind of a, a Another one dimension is, especially maybe from where lead starts, 
that message that transparency is the beginning, it's not the end. Transparency is a means, not an end. For a lot of people, transparency right now is confusing. And it's, it, it's what, you, Tom, you presented, you know, it, it's, it's the reason we have, we have the uh, list translator, it's the reason. But on the real short term, even when you cut yourself through that, you're still confused. So Brendan, do you have a thought about how, we, how do we get through this, this necessary first step? I mean, you can't go beyond this until we get through it. But for a lot of people, what they experience is confusion. And, they, and, and is, there, is there any message for you know, how, what the, what, how to set an expectation, how to move through this? I mean, uh, just a thought. Yeah, I, one of the things that, that uh, we, we got a grant, USGBC got a grant from a, an unbelievably generous grant from Google to, to try to advance the rate at which this transformation occurs and that, that confusion abates. Uh, part of the thing that I think was interesting about that grant was that it, it, it sort of gives us the opportunity to play a much more directed role in what has previously been a very messy and organic grassroots approach that has been responsible for the proliferation of all sorts of eco-labels. Tom showed you, I don't know, probably a tenth of what, <laughs> what, was act, what you could actually go out and look for. Maybe not, maybe not even that much. Um, and the, the, the thing that we've been trying to do is to, to, to bring the right organizations into the room and say, we have a goal that is different than our short-term goal. We have a long-term goal. It looks maybe potentially something like what I uh, proffered earlier. Uh, but the, the, the first step is to make sure that we're not deliberately or inadvertently confusing everybody. So that, that funding from Google is actually, my hope is that it is going to short circuit a lot of the, a lot of the, 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 the organic messiness that uh, was the hallmark of the, of the previous materials transformation related to green buildings. Uh, and I think we're already starting to see very <coughs> positive steps that are coming out. There is a harmonization report that is on the USGBC website that was funded by, by that grant that, that Tom and the Health Product Declaration and, and uh, Clean Production Action and uh, Declare and um, I'm missing one. Cradle, cradle. cradle to Cradle were, were responsible for basically giving us the inputs for, for that for that report and that report is the basis off of which we're saying all right now the next step is to make it you know sort of fit these pieces so I'm encouraged by that I really am but I also understand that you know Tom's excellent question about how many architects in the room got into it because they care about chemistry is one of those things that will probably not be something we ever really overcome as an industry uh, but so the, there's a there's a huge importance to making sure that the mechanisms and the tools that the design industry and the building industry sort of in a larger context rely on are credible and, and, and verifiable. And the, the, the work that we've started with E4 and, and moving forward is, is hopefully going to give us that, that, that assurance and make sure that the, tool, the right tools are available and that they are implementable and they're understandable and actionable for the people who need to make decisions today. Cool. All right, so that's great. So smart room. All right. Brendan, you have articulated in that slide, I think, to me, be the single most important conversation of today. Because I do think there's, uh, first of all, for those who don't, we're, we're building product manufacturers. We're cradle, cradle, silver, gold, multi attribute, and all that stuff. We've been, as Tom knows, we've been in this space for a very, very long time. of this is where we're going is so very, very important because right now it seems as though transparency is becoming the destination and that these two critical words, transformation and optimization, aren't in, aren't in the conversation. And as I look at transparency right now, it's simply uh, a way of looking in the neighbor's garage well, that's a messy garage. Let's get this thing cleaned up. <laughs> it really doesn't have anything to do with transformation or optimization. It's that starting point, and yet so many of the conversations are really, that seems to be a destination. And what you've articulated, I think, is a booster rocket just waiting to be lit up in the means that the U.S. Green Building Council has this pulpit from which it can 
carry forth that conversation and that I think this is a critical time for that conversation to be really on the lips of virtually everyone in that community so that there's an understanding. Because if the other, one of the other things you pointed out, if we place this in a in context that then can be acted upon with help and, and society and carry all those things forward and give people the tools to act, we remove the frustration. We hear the bad news, can't do anything about it. But we hear the bad news do something about it, and here are the tools to do something about it, and when we pop the champagne corks in 10 years and we, we find we've done something, it will be a journey that started because we knew where we were pretty much headed. And it just seems like transparency right now to me is, it's just a piece of plate glass. And there's not a lot of scenery on the other side, and you put, you put context well, on the other side. I certainly appreciate that context. and. Uh, I hope that the the idea that that you sh shared come true. I, I do want to put in a plug for transparency, though, uh, because it is not. It, it, we've heard from a lot of manufacturers. We've been engaging a lot of manufacturers, and we've heard from a lot of different uh, groups. The the the, I, the original idea for transparency came, um, at, at least the value of it came from. Uh, did we know TRI toxic release inventory, which was um, uh, an EPA regulation? Am I right about that? or a federal regulation that basically said that if you are releasing toxic emissions into the atmosphere, this was 70s, 80s, um, you have to tell people that you're doing it. You don't have to do anything about it. All you have to do is tell people that you're doing it. Uh, that was it, right? So it was transparency solely. But what happened as a result of TRI is that toxic emissions from all sources fell 40% without any regulation. Uh, over a period of like 20 years, which is it's, which is incredible, right? Because one of the things that we're hearing from manufacturers is, I can't tell people what's in it right now. I've got to fix the problems first, right? So I think that a lot of the, there, there's two sort of, there's a, there's a current and a countercurrent. Maybe it's not a, maybe it's a, a, a subversive current um, that, that, that exists of stuff that's already happening that we won't even know got fixed by the time we get told about it. And, you know, I'm fine with that, too. I will, right? I will just take one step back. We're strong advocates. Yeah, uh, yeah they're not mutually exclusive, yeah. right? Yeah. Totally. And actually, again, for the others, just to know, uh, we're the first building product manufacturer to put a product label, an ingredient label on our product. So we're sold on it. We're just kind of frustrated. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's kind of like I've been sitting here. Oh, man, I want to go somewhere. Yeah. I want to yeah. get on the other side of that plate glass. Well, you're yeah, absolutely. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about transparency being an endpoint for long. I don't think, I think we have actually a fairly um, narrow window in which transparency can kind of have its day on its own, uh, which is why I have, you know, after having worked hard to get the health product declaration and, and, and Pharos as a transparency tool out, I'm, my, you know, I'm, I'm delighted how the industry has taken it on because that gives me the freedom to look at to what I need to do next to take advantage of this because it is just the first, the first step, and we need to provide the tools um, for manufacturers to know what to do back in the in the hidden sandbox before they go transparent, and we need to provide more tools for selecting um, affirmatively better um, materials for the design firms, or else you know, within a couple of years there's going to be transparency burnout. You know, if it's only red flags. Um, then that's going to get kind of old after a while, and it's not something green that you can you can select. So we're working we're working hard on that. Okay. <laughs> Got that one. Okay. So uh, can you, can you use the mic? Yeah. Can you use the mic to do the questions? Sure. Okay. So um, okay. So I want to give a question from the uh, um, actually one quick quick commentary. I can't the camera. <laughs> just quick commentary. So <clears throat> one other way to look at transparency that this is something Dan Winters, who's our senior fellow for finance back there. Now, in the finance community, the lack of transparency is weighted by, say, risk-adjusted returns, right? The lack of transparency is a risk, thus you pay more yeah. for it. We have a kind of backwards thing here where you're paying a premium to get a less risky product. And so you can imagine the market pricing it in the other way. Sure, you don't have to disclose, but there should be a discount or a you know, or the other way around. So it would be interesting right. if it was handled the same way. But so the, the question we have from someone online, um, 
oftentimes local governments and entities that are charged with looking out for public good serve as leaders and early adopters. Is there an opportunity for similar leadership here? I think this means from local government or um, non-federal levels of government, serving as a leader through public infrastructure investments, district level investments, and uh, transits, et cetera. Any thoughts about the opportunity for non-federal leadership in the, in the space? I, I think that some of the most impressive policies that have ever been put out or have been at a local level or a state level, uh, I, you know, I think that they have been, for, for the entire time that, that LEAD has been around, among the very best examples of you know, responsible stewardship of uh, public money. I, I, my one caveat to that is I, I don't want them to regulate it out to other owners, right? So if, if, a, if, a, if a city or a state wants to say for our buildings we're going to build LEED, that's great. They're an owner, they can make that decision, you know, elections can come and go and those decisions can be overturned by, you know, whether or not the people are agreeing with that. Um, where I don't think LEED works particularly well is as a regulatory instrument for, in a non-voluntary capacity, and puts, it, it basically jams up the whole, the whole system. There are other tools for that for that process and I think that looking at uh, you know, IGCC or Standard 189 or any of the other regulatory instruments that were built to be that hammer on the, on the uh, uh, would be a better application but that should do nothing to deter uh, local, even federal engagement across the board because I think that, I, mean, I don't think it's at all a, a stretch to say that the leadership that, that the U.S. General Services Administration uh, showed and, and Department of Defense uh, early on was was you know, part of the reason that people started to pay attention to, to green building in general and lead specifically. Yeah, so we're actually already already seeing a um, number of, of local and state governments um, picking up the health product declaration, um, thinking of, oh, I'm having my foggy moment here, but um, the counties around Portland and Oregon has been uh, very um, very much in the, in the leadership on this. We're seeing um, some, some we've, we've seen work on, on toxic chemical avoidance from San Francisco for you know, a long time and they're, they're moving on the, on the flame retardant issue again now. Um, what's obviously the state is uh, California is, is, is moving on the flame retardant issue. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing a, a lot starting to pop um, in, in both transparency and, uh, and optimization at the local level and I think um, also at the, at the major owner level. Google is only now one of, of many um, who are, are starting to take a leadership role from the private side. Perfect. All right. So one quick question. Uh, Ken. And then one, one quick question and then we'll wrap up. Thanks. So I want to help you improve the answer to the ROI question. So oh, great. At the federal government, the largest share of the budget Um, let me restate the question. And actually, but what I think, given in the interest of time, I may restate the question and then refer you guys to each other. <laughs> and uh, who's here from Enterprise, of course, you guys know each other. She's got another great answer to that question. So, um, so yeah. that restate. Maybe the next panel. I, well, that's actually, actually, I'm going to pimp that in a second. So, the, <laughs> so that Ken's, Ken's statement was basically the lion's share, the, the largest uh, um, fraction of the federal budget goes to health care costs. We have a huge health burden. If, there is, if we can draw a causal connection between these kinds of efforts to reduce hazard and those expenses, there's a huge opportunity. And your point was we need to do better at making, at having research and implementation to, to make that connection. That's probably loosely paraphrased. And so I, I know that both of you have thoughts on that. So why don't, in the interest, we're closing in on the bottom of the hour. And I, and the other thing I was going to add is Enterprise is doing really great work on that in the context of affordable housing. So there are lots of things going on that will help us do that, but it, it's certainly early days. Very much so, thanks. these guys. Mm -hmm.